As Nick mentioned, we're continuing our study in the book of Acts, which the book of Acts in the New Testament is a really interesting book because it is sort of this narrative, this history of how the church began, how the church actually started, and we find our, we trace our roots all the way back to what we're reading in the book of Acts, and we've been doing this for a couple of months now, looking at each chapter, kind of looking at the story and what's taking place, and what's really fascinating about this is even though it tells us something about where we came from, I really believe it's challenging us in our present about who we're becoming. Uh, Because I think for many of us today, we sort of look back at the past, we look at the history of the church, and we say there's some really cool things that happened back then, um, but maybe they don't happen the way we expect them to happen today. And so what we're looking at this for is this understanding, even an expectancy, that what we see in the early church would be something we would see happening in our own midst, in our context, that we would see it happening in ways that, um, that are consistent with who we are today, but we're longing for that. One of the things that's fascinating as you look at this, and I, I, I find myself thinking about this a lot during this series, is how this group of people that we're reading about, a group of people who were marginalized culturally, socioeconomically, politically. They were people who were oppressed by another occupying nation. They weren't necessarily wealthy. These aren't individuals who um, had any sort of means per se. Uh, they don't really have any power. How this marginal group of people, probably with marginal education and marginal means, somehow impacted the world so significantly that their day and age was literally transformed by, by who they were. And history has been changed because of them. Like, how is this even possible, right? How is it possible that today we sit here and it's largely a result of what was happening in the lives of these people? Now, the beginning of the book of Acts explains the answer to this question, and that's really, really clear. It's because of God's empowering presence with these people. God was moving among these people. God was powerfully upon them. He was speaking to them. They were in relationship with God. They were interacting with God. There was something dynamic that was taking place, and because of God's empowering presence, they became people who were different as a result of this. They were moving in ways and living in ways that changed the culture around them. So as we study this, what we're looking for is that we would have the same sort of experience. I hear people talk about it that today. They say, Do people have a relationship with God? Is it possible to have interactions with God? And I think that's a really good question. What does it look like to have a relationship with God? What does it look like for us to interact with God, for God to be with us and moving in our lives? The text we're looking at today, it's so clearly evident that God is at work that we have to ask the question and say, is that something that happens for us today? Can we expect God to be moving in our lives today? Can we really have a relationship? Because that word, relationship, last time I checked, it means we converse, right? It means we talk. It means we're going to share things back and forth. Can we have a relationship with God? Is that possible? I know for me, I'm just going to share a couple of things from my past. Going back um, about 15 years or so, uh, there was a particular season in my life where, um, actually when I look at my life as a whole, there are seasons in which it seems like God was moving in more tangible ways than in others, right? Like the the blips on the radar were like at an all-time high, like somehow like God was really moving. If you want to use that sort of language, sometimes I wonder what does that even mean? God was moving in my life? God was speaking to me? Was it audible? No. I mean, you know, we can say those kinds of things, but there are particular seasons where it seems like God was moving more dramatically and dynamically than other seasons. One of those seasons was around 2001. My wife and I Uh, We've been kind of like serving in ministry and doing different things, but really began sensing that God was stirring something larger on our hearts, like he was putting something bigger. I don't even know, again, here's this kind of language we use, right? God was putting something on our hearts. I don't even know what that means or how to describe it. Some of you might say, I know what you mean, but it was like this burden, right? Like there was something about the church that we were supposed to be involved with in a new way. Like there was something we were supposed to be doing with, with communities of faith that was fresh and it was new. And we began to wrestle with some of these stories I'm going to keep using all this language because we just do, right? There are all these things that were happening. And about that time, I was contacted by Joe Whitwer over at Life Center. And uh, he contacted me about the possibility of moving to Spokane and starting a new church here. And so um, excited and hearing God's voice, right? We decided we need to explore this because God was moving and we were looking at circumstances and all these things. And so uh, we bought plane tickets and we flew into Spokane International Airport from Phoenix, Spokane International Airport, by the way, looks very small as you're coming in. Um, By the way, I figured out like in the weeks before that that Spokane wasn't a suburb of Seattle, (laughs) right? This is years and years ago, right? Like I was like, I always thought Spokane was like right around Seattle somewhere, you know? And uh, and so we land, you know, we get here and it's in the middle of nowhere, it turns out. And uh, and so we get in the car and we drive down on 90 and we're coming into town and the first exit is Maple Street. We take Maple Street. 
And, uh, and, you know, obviously we're thinking about living here. So our eyes are wide open. We're like our senses are alive. We're taking everything in. And we drive up Maple to High Drive. And the person driving us is like, this is Spokane, right? And we're like, this is amazing, right? So we keep going around on High Drive and we come to the Rocket Market, right? The Rocket Gas Station. The first time in my life I ever went to a gas station where they made Americanos, right? Like, <laughs> Like years ago, that didn't happen, and it certainly didn't happen in Phoenix. So we pull in, and we get coffee that was actually good at a gas station, and I'm like, this is heaven. Like, <laughs> Spokane's amazing, right? And so immediately, like within 10 minutes, I, I looked at Sherry, I was like, I, I hear the voice of God. <laughs> like, he is moving in our lives, and I think we're supposed to live here, right? And it turns out, like, getting to know Joe and, and some of the staff at Life Center, we immediately started to fall in love with some of the people but we were falling in love with the city. Like in a week's time, um, we were just wandering the South Hill and hanging around downtown. We did accidentally go east on Sprague one day. Big mistake. (laughs) So we came back to the South Hill. (laughs) Whole time was on the South Hill. We loved the South Hill. The South Hill was great, right? Like we just loved it. Loved it. I remember we went to Manitou Park and we're just like, we had two little girls at that time. We didn't, Meg wasn't even born yet. And I just remember we were just imagining, can you imagine? Like we were just, can you see them swinging on those swings and playing on the, you know, like we were so all in on the South Hill. Like this is our home. So a few months later, guess what we did? We moved to the South Hill. We got a house over on 17th and, and Cedar and, uh, and we, we rented a place and we're going to live on the South Hill and now we're thinking about starting a new community of faith in, in Spokane, right? And the only place in Spokane that we could imagine doing that was guess where? The South Hill, right? Because this was God's gift to humanity. And so we're like every place, like every vacant building, the Women's Center down there on 14th or whatever, you know, like every building we looked at, we were like, maybe there, maybe here, maybe we could, and everything was on the South Hill. And then one day, Um, Joe came to me and he said, hey, you know, um, we've got churches. In fact, Summit has recently started on the South Hill and um, there's a big city out there and I'd really prefer it if you didn't start a church on the South Hill. And I was like, no. No, I, I moved here because I like the coffee shop in the gas station and the Manitou Park and the whole, like, no, like, this is, my, this is my parish. These are my people. Like, God spoke to my heart about this neighborhood. Like, this, like, I don't, at that point in time, I don't think we'd been a mile north of the river ever. Like, we were just like, this is it. But then we did it. We, we planted a church. Uh, our first church that we started was in Hilliard, which, you know, is kind of different than the South Hill. <laughs> Little, right? And, uh, and for three years, we just watched God do some really cool things in that community of faith. It was awesome. And uh, some of you guys that are here were a part of that with us. And um, it, was, it was really beautiful. It was really amazing. But I just, I'm just going to share something really transparent and personal in this moment. It always felt like God kind of bait and switched me. You know? Like, you showed me the South Hill, but then, like, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Hilliard, and it's just, I, didn't, I never felt connected, and there was always this sort of thing in my heart, and I kind of wrestled with it. And uh, after three years, we got contacted by another organization. They said, will you come plant churches in New York City? And so um, we did. We just, like, at this point, it was just like, well, okay, like, God never fulfilled that thing in our hearts here. Let's go there. And so we went to New York. Long, different story. A couple years after that, we never thought we'd be back in Spokane. A couple years after that, we come back to Spokane. We move, guess where? On the South Hill. And uh, and at this time, I don't want to pastor anything, anywhere, or anyone uh, at that point in time, in fact, some of you know the story, I just, I became a stockbroker. I didn't want to pastor a church. And uh, there was this journey of healing that God was doing in my heart. I didn't know if I could trust God. I didn't know if I could listen to his promises anymore. These things that he'd prompted in me, I was like, man, is God really, can I really bank on those things? Fast forward three years, and I get asked to pastor this little church called Summit up on 57th, meeting in the Seventh-day Adventist Congregations building. And I'm like, I guess it makes sense. So we do. And I'm really slow sometimes. So we're about two years in. And uh, we'd been growing and I'm not sure that we bought this property yet. But we were having fun. And it was just like, man, this is great. This is amazing. And like, I just felt like all the cylinders in my engine were firing. Like, man, God, this is what you made me for. And suddenly it dawned on me. I was like, oh, all of those experiences all the ups and the downs and the valleys and the peaks and the winds and the losses, all those things that I've been experiencing for the last decade were the things you were doing in my heart to make me the kind of leader that this community deserved. 
And I realized, like, God, I'd have screwed things up if you'd have answered it my way, right? Had you given me what I wanted 10 years ago, there's no way. But then in that moment, there was this sudden realization, like, God, you somehow, in your architecture of this thing, in, in your arrangement of things, you have created a scenario where the thing you put on my heart was fulfilled, but in a way that I never expected. And that, that, begins, um, that begins some thinking on my part. There are lots of ways that you can describe what it looks like to walk with God or how to have a relationship with God or to interact with God. There's lots of um, vernacular that we can use around those different things to categorize what it means to actually like, live life in connection with this deity that has created us. But if I were to describe my experience with words, um, it would be something like this. A relationship with God begins with staggeringly good promises from a God who never fails, followed by a long and complex fulfillment of those promises. Amen? You have to have long and complex because that's just the way it goes. Like any bit of life, and you start realizing this, God does not seem to work in our time, does he? It doesn't seem to work in our ways. And there's plenty of times when I thought, man, God, I'd really appreciate it if you do things in my way and my time. But here's something I think we need to understand that's incredibly important as we consider what it looks like to have a real relationship with God. In the long and in the complex fulfillment of God's promises, we learn to trust his character, not our circumstances. That's what we're learning let me, just, let me say this again so that we're clear in this. In the long and complex fulfillment of God's promises, we learn to trust God's character and not our circumstances. And that's what's going on. We, we, he doesn't abandon us to try to interpret the circumstantial events around our life to see whether or not we should go here or there or whether or not he's with us or he's not with us. We aren't subject to the whims of our emotions and how we're feeling at any given time to determine whether or not we are doing what we're supposed to be doing. Our lives aren't defined by the valleys or by the peaks of any particular season that we find ourselves in. There are these staggeringly good promises from a God who never fails, and there is a long and complex fulfillment of that with moments of intense joy, and there are moments of deep pain, but all of those are held together in a relationship of trust, in a God of character. And that's what it means to walk with God. That's what it means to have a relationship with God. So the question I just want to begin with today is this. Do you have that kind of relationship with God? Is it real? Is it, are, you, are, you, are you letting God speak into your life and lead you? Is God moving in your circumstances, in your life? Are you, are you following him? Do you trust him regardless of what's happening around you because of his character? See, the text that we're looking at this morning, there, there's a whole lot of things going on. In fact, um, I could preach three different sermons on this or one really long one, uh, and I just decided to do just one section of this today and, and talk about this because this text just by the very nature of what's going on here, if we don't even look at the details of what's happening, how things unfold here reveal a relationship with God that is powerful and moving and real and dynamic. Because in this text, we see God arranging things in a particular way for specific people, and I think it's challenging for us to look at in here. So if you have a Bible, I want you to open up Acts chapter 10. We're just going to read this. We're going to unpack it together. And, uh, and then as we close today, we're going to take communion together. So um, beginning in verse 1 of Acts chapter 10, this is what it says. It says, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. A devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. Now about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He's lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So we have Cornelius, first character we're going to look at today. He's a centurion. He is Roman. He's not Jewish. 
He's in the city of Caesarea, and God says, you need this guy, Peter, to come say some things to you. And he's all the way over in Joppa, right? He's not down the street. He's not across town. He's in another city, right? So then there's this crazy part, right, where he gets these guys. He's like, calls a couple servants, one of his soldiers. Guys, come in here. So um, just a minute ago, uh, an angel came in and uh, was telling me that, uh, you know, like at this point, like his voice is trailing off. They're like looking at each other like, did, you, did he just say an angel just... Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, think about this. Here's a centurion leader. He's a leader of a regiment. And he's like, guys, listen, there's an angel that just spoke to me. And they're like, um, all right. And obviously not wanting to offend him, they do what he asked them to do. But he says there's an angel that's spoken and is sending, I want to send you guys to go find this guy. And he's at this house, this guy's house, and his name is this name, and I want you to go get him. And they're like, okay, well, We'll go do that, right? So verse 9 says this. says, The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, second individual we're going to look at today, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance, which um, there's a lot of Sunday afternoons. This happens to me, by the way. I, <laughs> I get hungry and I fall into like some sort of food coma, whatever. So he's hungry. He falls into a trance, and it says he saw the heavens opened up and something like a great sheet descended, being let down by its four corners upon the earth, and in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, and there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything Common or unclean. So whatever is on this sheet is stuff that was forbidden for Jews to eat. It was food that was considered unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time and said, what God has made clean, do not call common. Then this happened three times. Three times, probably because Peter argued three times, right? Right? And then the thing was taken up at once to heaven. You say to yourself, what in the world is that all about, right? Kind of a crazy dream. I have crazy dreams. Anyone else have crazy dreams? Anyone else wake up in the morning and go, what was that all about, right? So did Peter. Check it out. It says, verse 17, while Peter was inwardly perplexed, (laughs) right? I mean, he's just like, what in the world is this, right? Inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he'd seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Peter, Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I've sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I'm the one you're looking for. What's the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. Right? Somebody shows up at your house, knocks on the door. Hey, so there's this guy over in Coeur d'Alene, and he sent me over here. And I, by the way, I walked. And uh, they want us to go back over because God told them you're, you're supposed to come over and say some stuff to him, right? Like, what would you, like, you'd be like, I'm calling 911, right? <laughs> so you can imagine, like, anyone's perspective of this. You go, what, what's happening here? And Peter's like, man, I just had this crazy dream. And they're like, well, trust us. Like, this is evidently a thing right now. And then you get verse 23. It says, So he invited them to be his guest, and the next day he rose and went away with them. And some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. So he's got a little entourage, right? And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. So when Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter lifted up and said, Stand up. I'm a guy just like you. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many people gathered. So like they're walking into the house. You imagine this. And there's like, he walks in, like rounds the corner, and there's like this. He's like, whoa, okay, there's all these people in here. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone from another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. So why'd you send for me? (laughs) Basically what he says. So I asked then, why did you send for me? 
This is fascinating, right? So Peter walks in the room and he sees all these people and he, culturally, this is taboo. Like this is unheard of. Not only that, it's against the Jewish law for him to be fraternizing with these individuals. Politically, this is inconceivable. Let me just explain why. Cornelius as a centurion, he's an individual who's leading this regiment of the Roman army in occupied Israel. He's an individual who was placed there as, a, as an occupying force to help maintain peace in this nation that is subject to this larger empire. So Cornelius' presence in the room is this constant reminder. His presence in Israel is this constant reminder of the dominance of Rome over Israel. Now, you go, well, what, what's, what the, what's the big deal with that? Well, if you were a Jewish individual or someone like Peter growing up and hearing these staggeringly good promises of God, the presence of a Roman army or a guy like Cornelius seemed to indicate that God wasn't fulfilling his promises, seemed to indicate like God wasn't even with us, seemed to indicate that God didn't hold out hope for us, right? So for them, there was this reminder that God hadn't fulfilled his promises. So they weren't even hanging out together. They were the enemy. They were the the different ones. So we have a geographical barrier that's being bridged, but more importantly, we have this socio-political barrier of two radically different cultures that's coming together in this clash in this moment. Why does it come together? Well, because of these visions, but also because Peter says, God showed me something so that I could get past this. Like God's revealed something to me. He gave me a vision so that this moment could be made possible. In the next three verses, we won't read them, but Cornelius basically says, here's the dream I had, right? So Peter's like, I had a dream. You had a dream. Tell me about your dream, right? So they tell each other about their dreams. And then he says, so you're here to talk to us. Talk about pressure, right? Peter's like, man, I didn't write a sermon on my way. What am I supposed to say, right? I want you just to capture this for a moment. Think about this. Has God gone to great lengths to arrange this conversation? He has, hasn't he? Like, you think about this. God has gone to great lengths to arrange this conversation. God has done something to bring these two individuals together. He's moved, He's led, He's prompted. He's done all sorts of this stuff that we try to put language to that's difficult to understand. And before we actually get into what Peter says when he's given the opportunity to talk, because we're gonna do that as we take communion today, before we get into that, I wanna pause and just consider the way that God intervened in this. Like God intervened in a powerful way to make this moment happen, right? We all agree with this. God did something. Peter and Cornelius would have never landed in the same room together. They would have never come up with the conclusions that they both come up with if it were not for God moving them beyond their comfort zone, God moving them to things they would never have naturally concluded on their own. God speaks to both of them in such a profound way that we have to pay attention to what's happening in this story. So think about this. So for both of these individuals, something really uncomfortable, but we just need to talk about this because many of us don't know what to do with this, God gives them both a prophetic vision, right? I know some of you, you know, like, what, what in the world is going on? Like, does God still do this sort of thing, right? Like, maybe some of you say, God's never done that to me. Like, I never, like, like fell into a trance in the middle of being hungry on a roof somewhere. Like, that hasn't happened to me, right? Which, by the way, let me just say, that is very normal. Like, the way that God seems to work in his kingdom, how he accomplishes his mission in people's lives is usually through other individuals. It's people to people. He moves, the the kingdom of God moves along relational lines. That's how it typically moves. But occasionally God moves outside of that. And that's what we're seeing here, right? God's moving. And God's love is being expressed in this, right? God's love is being expressed towards human beings. It's being expressed because he gives this vision to Cornelius, like a vision that, that resolved tension in his heart. Cornelius understood. I could be a Roman centurion. I can live in Caesarea by the sea. Certainly he had a nice little pad. The Roman government had set him up well, but he was never going to be satisfied. Even though he was respected by people, there was this longing in Cornelius' heart for more. There was this emptiness. God was stirring in his life, and then God speaks to him. God was stirring, and then God speaks. I want us to understand that together. And then Peter, he has this vision where he gets God's heart for humanity. We gotta understand something that throughout history, ever since the fall, it has been the tendency of human beings because of of self-preservation, because of fear, to protect themselves from people who are different. 
So we tell stories about people who are barbarians. We, we create fables about people to, to strike fear into others' hearts. We build walled off cities and we talk about how the other can never be accepted by us. And Peter's no exception to this. We, we need to understand that in this text, we're, what's being revealed to us is that Peter was a racist. There's no apology given. Like, it was rooted in his history, it was rooted in his religion, but it was true. There was deep-rooted racism in his, in his heart. And the law that God had given the people of Israel had been warped and manipulated into a form of racism. And God had to break him of this. So Peter has this vision about food, and God says, I want you to eat this food. He says, I didn't eat that food. What's that all about? What's God saying? The the line that stands out is him simply saying, don't call something, or more appropriately, someone, unclean that I have made. Don't call a person, a human being that has been made in my image, regardless of how different they are from you, or where they're from, or what language they speak, don't call them unclean if they're from me. Why does he do this? Because God's kingdom is about breaking down socioeconomic and racial and geographical boundaries so that all people everywhere can experience his love and his grace. Amen? So God speaks personally and he speaks prophetically to these men to make arrangements for their meeting. And I know this is unusual for some of you. I know this might be foreign for some of you. But let me just say there are examples from some of us in this room that have had these same experiences where God is... God has moved, God has prompted, we've gotten some sort of picture and we've wondered like, is that God? But as we've leaned into it and we've trusted his character rather than our circumstances, we've discovered beautiful and wonderful things. And I think it's important that we understand this morning as we sit and we look at a text like this in a room like this, that that Christianity can never be reduced to something that happens in a lecture hall. It can't be reduced to good sermons that just made good logical sense to us. We need God's word to be made true and alive in our hearts, in our lives in a way that actually impacts us. We need God to speak prophetically to us. We need God to lead us in our careers. We need God to speak to us in our relationships. We need God to lead us in our interactions with other people in our community. We need God to to lead us in our dreams and our passions, in the things that the projects that we want to accomplish, the things we hope for for other people. All of those things we need to lean in and say, God, can you speak to me? Will you speak to me? And if you speak to me, I'll listen to you. God's still doing these things. God's spirit is moving. And we need to be sensitive to the moving of God's spirit. Acts chapter one, verse eight, the reason these people are these people is because Jesus said, I'm gonna give you my spirit who's gonna be with you and alongside of you. So we need to be sensitive. If the spirit has been given to us and alongside of us, are we listening? Are we paying attention to the nudge? When we're praying and there's some sort of picture that we're given, is if suddenly there's passion that stirs up or wells up inside of us, if there's something just pops in our minds. I know there's times for me I'll be worshiping in here and we'll be in the middle of worship and all of a sudden I'll think of a conversation that I had with somebody two weeks ago and I go, that didn't resolve well. I I need to go back to that. And I just trust that's just God moving in a very simple way because he cares about my relationships. Are we doing those things? Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're big, but it can't be dismissed. If Peter would have just blamed his hunger, which by the way, that's what I would have done, right? I do crazy stuff when I'm hungry. If this dream would have happened, I would have gone, man, I gotta get some food in my stomach because I just had the wackiest dream, right? If Peter would have done that, the interaction never would have happened. If Cornelius would have in his pride said, there's no way that I could tell my men to, to travel to another city because I saw an angel. If he in his pride would have tried to preserve his image, The interaction never would have happened. It required both of these individuals to lean in and to trust God in this moment, even though it defied what their presuppositions might have been. So we believe God's spirit is still moving. We believe God's spirit is still leading people. And if we believe that God is really in relationship with people, then in this hyper-rational, 
over-educated, post-Christian world that we live in, there should be moments when the voice of God invades and speaks louder than any of the rationalism or education or cultural pressure possibly could, that God is moving into those things and prompting us. He is still the God of the impossible. He's still a God who gives promptings. He is still a God who makes promises and a God who impresses things on our hearts. He's still a God who asks us to go in directions that don't always make sense in the moment. And then he says, the clarity that you want about where you're supposed to go or what you're supposed to do, that doesn't come now. It comes later. It comes after you've done what I'm asking you to do because I'm trying to get you to trust my character, not your circumstances. I want you to trust me, not the moment that you're in. This stirs all kinds of things for me. Like, do you have things in your heart that have gone dormant? Hopes or dreams or promises? And you feel like, man, God placed this in my heart. But there's very little happening. What do we do with those things? God says, I want you to trust me, not your circumstances. Now, back to the text. A lot went into making this conversation happen, right? We all agree with this? So obviously Peter goes from Joppa to Caesarea, goes over all these barriers because he has something to say. What is so important that Peter could say that these people need to hear? Like, what is it that that he had to deliver? So Cornelius has a house full of people. Peter has the entourage. And this conversation is so critical that it changes things. Verse 34, so Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what's right is acceptable, acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses to all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to those of us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he's the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Spirit was poured out even on Gentiles. For they're hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Spirit just as we have? And then he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they asked him to remain for days. So God puts him in the room for this conversation. And the reason for it was so that they could hear the good news of Jesus. Like what Peter says is what we've been reading all along. Here's Jesus. Here's the good news of Jesus. But what is that good news? Verse 36 is the key. The peace, literally he says, Preaching, preaching the peace of Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Jesus, why do they need to hear this? Because Jesus is the peace, right? Jesus is peace. And when he, when he says the word peace, it's the Hebrew concept of, of shalom. It is internal, individual peace, something that overrides our souls. And it is external, public flourishing. It is things being set right again. It is people relating the way they were intended, people working the way they were created. It is this idea of life being the way that we were created to live our lives. That's what he reveals in this moment. He says, the peace of Jesus comes over you. It's about his peace. Jesus is peace. That's what they needed. This peace is a peace that comes not just in one dynamic. It's a peace that comes with God. It's a peace that comes with ourselves. It's a peace that that takes place with one another. Think about this. Um, Right from the very beginning, Adam and Eve the story in Genesis, this, this poetic story that describes 
the fall of humanity, the intimacy that they had with God was ruptured in that moment. Their relationship with God is broken. And in that moment, there's fear and there's insecurity that enter the hearts of Adam and Eve. And the intimacy with each other, it's completely broken. So they're insecure, they're, 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 the intimacy is broken with each other, their relationship with the world is broken. That's the whole point of that story. And then Peter says in this moment that Jesus brings peace, brings peace between us and God, brings peace between us and ourselves, brings peace with us and others. We begin to live in a grace paradigm with God that allows us to live in that grace paradigm with others. Peace through Jesus. And then there's this key that he, that he hints at here. Jesus who is Lord of all. I think it's interesting because Peter doesn't just say Jesus who, you know, was this guy. He says Jesus who was Lord of all. And when I look at this story and I look at Peter and I look at Cornelius, I think there's a direct correlation between the peace of Jesus and our willingness to allow Jesus to be Lord of all. The peace of Jesus is somehow connected to him being the Lord of everything in our lives which means our surrender to Jesus is connected to our peace in our life. Our recognition of him being the authority in all the things related to our life, not us being the authority on him, but him being the authority on our lives, that that is somehow deeply embedded with our experience of tangible and real shalom. The rebuilding of our lives, the peace in our souls, the connection with others, So this response of surrender to the rule of Jesus in our lives, that's what leads to peace. Peace with God, peace with ourselves, peace with other people. So this morning, we're gonna close by taking communion together. The ushers are gonna come distribute the elements today. And and, this is something we just do. We just do it because Jesus sat with his disciples in an upper room and he said, I want you to always do this. I want you to always remember me and I want you to remember what I've done for you. But I think oftentimes we ask the question, well, why? Why did Jesus put this into place and why do we need to remember him? And I think the answer this morning is in our text. Because if the peace of Jesus is dependent upon our surrender to Jesus, The only way we will ever surrender to anyone in our lives is if we are supremely confident that that person is for us, amen? The only way you and I will ever surrender all of the areas, all the aspects of our life is if we are supremely confident that that person is for us. And when you and I hold the bread and the cup in our hands and we see tangibly and we hold physically a symbol that says, Even in our most broken, defiant, rebellious state, God loved us and came for us to extend love to us. When we sit and we hold that, it's like this statement that says, I can trust you. There's like a humility that comes over us in that moment, right? There's a humility that says, even in my brokenness, you did this for me. Like your perspective of me was so much larger and so much bigger and so much better than my own perspective of me. And there's this humility that when we take the bread and the cup, it humbles us. And as we do that, we surrender. So this morning, I'm just gonna challenge you as the ushers distribute the elements and as the band sings, would you just consider the level of surrender in your hearts? Are you surrendering your life? Do you trust the character of God more than the circumstances around you? Are you surrendering everything to him and trusting him? Before the elements are distributed, I'm gonna pray. If you'll hold them, I'll come back up and then we'll take them together in just a moment. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for your amazing love for us and your care for us. And and Lord, this morning, even for me, just to be reminded that um, your direction for my life, your, your, your love of me extends far beyond any present circumstances that I find myself in. And I, I just ask, Lord, this morning that for all of us in the room, as we, as we remember what you've done for us, it would humbly remind us of who you are and that we would surrender our lives fully and that we would experience your peace as a result. In your name we pray, amen. You know, Jesus sat in this, in this room with his disciples and he, 
uh, they were having the Passover meal and he broke the bread and he said, this is my body that's broken for you. And then he poured wine into a cup and he said, this is my blood that's poured out for you. And he said, I want you to, to, to remember me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, I want you to remember what I've done for you. And I think the reason that he said that is because he knew there were going to be days when things got dark. And there were going to be days when the overwhelmingly beautiful promises of God would seem like a far distant dream and not a reality. And I think he knew there were going to be days and we needed to be reminded of God's love so that we could just simply get through. So he said, remember, remember, because I want you to trust my character, not your circumstances. I want you to trust me, not what's happening around you. So this morning we join with the disciples the way they've done for centuries in the middle of dark days and say, Lord, we trust you. Let's eat and let's drink together in remembrance of him. Would you stand with me? As you're standing, I'll just let you know there are some folks that will be available down front. If you want to talk with somebody this morning, if you want to pray with somebody, you've got stuff going on in your life, if there's things you just say, hey, I've got to connect some dots, um, whatever that thing may be, they're going to be down here after the service, and you're more than welcome to come chat with them for a bit. But as you, as you leave today, may you be men and women who experience the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. May you hear God's voice. May you be led by him. May you trust God's character more than your circumstances and may you see where it leads you. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. We love you guys. Be nice to each other getting out of here. It's kind of crowded. We'll see you guys next Sunday. See you later.